poetry of religious relics continues to this day. Israeli archaeologist Oded Gulam claimed to have purchased an ossuary, a limestone box from the first century AD that was said to contain bones from an antique shop in Jerusalem in 1976. In 2002, he applied for a permit to ship the ossuary abroad for exhibition in Toronto. He also showed it to André Lemaire, a scholar at La Sorbonne in Paris. Lemaire noted an inscription that Golan claimed not to have seen. It was written on the outside of the ossuary in Aramaic. Yaakov bar Yosef Akui di Yeshua, James, the son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. It suddenly occurred to both Lemaire and Golan that this might be just the ossuary containing the bones of James, believed to be the brother of Jesus Christ. Lemaire published an article in the Biblical Archaeology Review stating that this was the very high probability that it was indeed an authentic inscription. But Golan had not noted the inscription in his application for a permit to export the work. If it were indeed an important religious relic, then Israel would be less likely to permit it to be sent abroad. The permit was accepted, and the ossuary was shipped to Toronto for exhibit. Though Golan claims to have paid only $200 for the ossuary, he insured it for transport at $1 million. The Toronto Museum to which it was shipped, the Royal Ontario Museum, estimated that it was worth $2 million because of its cultural significance. Suspecting that something was amiss, the Israeli Archaeological Association, the IAA, began an investigation. In March 2003, Israeli authorities arrested Golan on suspicion of forgery and dealing in fake antiquities. A board of IAA experts determined that while the ossuary itself was an authentic artifact, the inscription had been added to it in the modern era. Thus, it was a fake, not a forgery. I make that distinction, though, in daily conversation, we tend to use the two English words um, interchangeably, fake and forgery. From a criminological perspective, they're distinctive. And you may have heard at the VNA there have been famous exhibits of fakes and forgeries. That's not, in fact, repetitive. But a fake is a pre-existing object that is altered fraudulently in some way to increase its value, whereas a forgery is an object created wholesale from scratch in fraudulent imitation of something else. So because the ossuary was authentic, it already existed, but it was doctored, this fraudulent inscription was added, it's categorized as a fake, not a forgery. After the natural aging process that occurred to the limestone box, the results of centuries buried in a damp cave, someone had added the inscription to the back side of the box, covering the freshly cut lettering with a homemade patina of age based on a mixture of water and ground chalk. The issue being the object was probably 2,000 years old, the original object, um, and it had this patina of age around it, but freshly carved letters would have brushed that away, and then this patina had to be replicated in some fraudulent way. In the end, a five-man team of forgers led by Golan were found to have faked a number of biblical artifacts by adding inscriptions to authentic objects. A search of a storage facility rented by Golan unearthed forged ancient seals, and a series of inscriptions in various stages of production, as well as engraving tools and soil from excavation sites that would have been rubbed into the inscriptions to give the illusion of age and long burial. Golan and his team were carrying on a centuries-old tradition, and it might have been money that was their ultimate goal, but it was never clear if they planned to sell the ossuary. Possessing what seems to be a famous relic shot them into the headlines and brought them power, ephemeral though it proved to be. Now we're going to shift gears from two religious relic forgeries to two scientific forgeries. The same motivations that prompt artists to turn into forgers have also led scientists to discover rather more than the natural evidence presented. While the focus of my work is primarily on the art world, the parallel motivations of fame having gotten away with fooling a fame and having gotten away with fooling a community of so-called experts may be found in the world of science and natural history as well. In 1912, scientists learned of an unusual skull and jawbone 
said to have been excavated at a gravel pit in the town of Piltdown in East Sussex, England. The bone fragments were purchased by collector Charles Dawson and given the Latin binomial nomenclature Eoanthropos dolsoni, named after him. It seemed for several decades that these bone fragments came from a previously unknown early human, a link between apes and Homo erectus, that confirmed the theory of evolution. It was not until 1953 that this discovery was found to have been a forgery. The lower jawbone of an orangutan had been coupled with a modern human skull. Hybridizations of natural remains were nothing new in 1912. Collectors of natural curiosities during the Renaissance and Enlightenment gathered together authentic wonders. Rudolf II of Prague, for instance, kept a giant octopus in a glass tank and a gaggle of penguins running around his castle. And they kept these alongside manufactured supernatural creatures. Narwhal tusks were sold as unicorn horns, and whale bones were thought to be from dragons. It is not always clear when an over-enthusiastic naturalist was guilty of nothing more than wishful thinking or when a crime was committed. Pre-modern scientists stumbling upon dinosaur bones might reasonably think that they had discovered the skeleton of a dragon. After all, what is a dinosaur if not the embodiment of our concept of a dragon? Hanging behind the altar at the Church of San Donato on the Venetian island of Murano are a pair of colossal bones that are the so-called dragon bones of San Donato, the saint supposedly and oddly having slain a dragon by spitting on it. While the bones have not been scientifically tested, they almost certainly came either from a whale or a prehistoric skeleton. No one was willfully practicing deceit when the bones were ceremonially arrayed in a church and claimed to be from a dragon. Scientific forgeries run along similar lines, although in the case of the Piltdown Man, the fraud was an active one. It was also one of the most enduring scientific frauds in that it succeeded for over 40 years, resonating with the much-discussed human theory of evolution. The discovery began with Charles Dawson's announcement at a meeting of the Geological Society of London on 18 December 1912 of his acquisition of bone fragments. A workman at the site had found the skull and at first had believed it to be a fossilized coconut. Dawson found further fragments at the site and took them to the geology department of the British Museum. The curator there, Arthur Smith Woodward, studied the fragments for several months alongside Dawson. Their analyses were presented to great excitement at the Geological Society meeting. Dawson claimed that the skull was remarkably similar to modern man's, but for the occiput, where the skull meets the spine, and for the brain size, which was two-thirds that of a modern man. Two human-like molar teeth in the jawbone looked indistinguishable from a chimpanzee's and included ape-like canines. Dawson claimed that his new discovery seemed to provide an evolutionary missing link between apes and modern man. This assertion was contested from the start. While the British Museum and Dawson and Woodward had developed one reconstruction of the skull, the Royal College of Surgeons, led by Arthur Keith, produced a very different looking one from copies of the same bone fragments, in which the brain size was precisely that of a modern man. This alternative reconstruction was called Homo Piltdownensis, the word Homo reflecting its nearer proximity to Homo erectus. While searching the gravel pit in August 1913, Dawson, Woodward, and a Jesuit priest called Teilhard de Chardin found canine teeth that fit the jaw. Teilhard soon left to return to France and never again participated in the discoveries, a fact which struck some as suspicious at the time. The canine seemed to fit perfectly with a jawbone, but as soon as its discovery was announced, it raised further questions. Keith pointed out that human molars are meant for lateral movement, to grind food when chewing. The canine now, in, the canine now integrated into the piltdown jaw made no evolutionary sense because its verticality meant that it would get in the way of the lateral movement that molars required. The molars found on the jawbone were worn down, meaning that the creature had used them extensively. The canine that Dawson had added to the skull would essentially have blocked the creature from eating food it had gathered. 
something was not right. In 1913, David Watterson of King's College, London, solved the mystery of the Piltdown Man hoax. In Nature magazine, he wrote that he believed the bones to be a combination of an ape's mandible with a human skull. French paleontologist Marceline Boulle published the same conclusion in 1915, as did an American zoologist, Garrett Smith Miller. In 1923, Franz Weidnicht noted that the skull was simply a human cranium and the mandible from an orangutan whose teeth had been filed down, but it would take decades before this was conclusively proven and believed. Dawson passed away in August 1916, at which point Woodward presented the new discoveries as if he had found them himself. President of the American Museum of Natural History, Henry Fairfield Osborne, declared that the two finds, Piltdown and Piltdown II, belonged together without question. The second Piltdown fragment seemed to confirm the authenticity of the first ones, at least for the majority of interested bystanders reading about this popular affair in newspapers. But now Dawson, the only man who knew the truth, was dead. Scientists, however, were not so convinced. The Piltdown Man discovery did not fit with other fossil and evolutionary discoveries. Either this was some strange mutation of the ape-to-man continuum, or it was a fake. The hoax was definitively proven in Time magazine, but not until 1953. Evidence gathered from a wide array of renowned scientists proved that the Piltdown Man bones came from three distinct species, a medieval human skull, a 500-year-old lower mandible of a Sarawak orangutan, and fossilized teeth of a chimpanzee. The medieval human skull was the only piece of bone that had actually been discovered at Piltdown. All the fragments had been aged by bathing them in iron and chromic acid. Microscopic examination showed that the molars had been filed down with a metal file so that the chimpanzee teeth would look more human. The forger has never been identified, although, of course, the man whose notoriety came from its discovery, Charles Dawson, is the main suspect. Woodward at the British Museum and the French Jesuit Théaud were also possibly involved in the conspiracy. A later examination of Dawson's once-renowned natural history collection found 38 certain fakes, including other species discovered by Dawson, like Plagialux dawsoni, teeth from a purported hybrid mammal reptile. Other fakes and frauds that helped to make Dawson's name included the Pevensey bricks, which were supposedly the last datable discovery from Roman Britain, flint from the Levant Caves, a fake flint mine, the Beauport Park statuette, a fake Roman-era iron statue, the Brighton toad in the hole, a real toad inside a piece of flint, and a fake Chinese bronze vase. Dawson was thought to have been behind all of these. The motivation was his renown as a collector and amateur scientist and the attention that accompanied the discoveries. The greatest harm caused by the fraud was that for several decades, scientists wasted time investigating a step on the evolutionary ladder that actually did not exist. A similar fraud was perpetrated in 1999 involving paleontology. A fossil found in China was featured in National Geographic, which described it as the missing link that showed the evolutionary bridge between birds and terrestrial dinosaurs. Only recently have paleontologists determined that dinosaurs have more in common with birds than they do with lizards. For centuries, dinosaurs were thought to have been giant reptiles, Thunder Lizard being the nickname for the Brontosaurus. Scientists now agree that birds are the most direct descendants of dinosaurs, but the discovery of this fossil in China seemed to prove the theory definitively and was a major coup, just as the Piltdown Man appeared to be the final proof of the human-ape evolution theory. Sadly, it also proved to be a false one. A team of scientists in 2002 published verification that the Archaeoraptor fossil, as it became known, was a fake. Like Dawson's Piltdown Man, this had been constructed Frankenstein-like from pieces of real fossils from different species. The tail was that of a winged dromaeosaur, nicknamed a Microraptor. The body was that of a prehistoric bird, Yanornis. 
The legs and feet belong to an unidentified dinosaur of a different species. The scandal certainly hurt reputations, not least that of storied National Geographic magazine, but it also brought to light a lively trade in illegally excavated or forged fossils coming out of China. The forgery was not even particularly adept. In retrospect, it seemed evident to paleontologists that this missing link was in fact a cobbled together jigsaw of other fossils. But the hunger to find tangible proof for a missing link theory allowed the Archaeoraptor fossil and the Piltdown Man skull to enjoy the authentication of experts and considerable success, considerable success before they were ultimately found out. Now my concluding thoughts. All four of these case studies, while superficially different, have consistencies. All four led to fame for the discoverers, which would seem to be the primary motivation for creating the forgeries in the first place. Wealth, or the promise of it, followed, though the Archaeoraptor fossil was found out quickly enough to foil any plans of fortune, and the Shroud of Turin was a cash cow for the city in which it was housed rather than the individual who created it or passed it off initially as an original religious relic. Of all the cases purported to be missing links, artifacts, all of the cases purported to be missing links, artifacts that proved beliefs. The Shroud of Turin and the James Ossuary sought to provide Catholics with tangible proof of the life of Christ and his family. The Piltdown Man's skull was meant to prove Darwin's theory that modern humans evolved from apes, and the Archaeoraptor fossil fulfilled the same function for the theory that dinosaurs were related to birds. The takeaway from these cases is that any object that appears newly on the market or as a fresh discovery, and appears to ideally fulfill a theory, should be looked at with extensive scrutiny. Too good to be true often is. But the punchline is more complicated. In the case of the Shroud of Turin and the Piltdown Man skull, there were significant followings of people who refused to believe that their initial belief in the object was false. The multiple, published, objective scientific tests that show the Trout of Turin to be a medieval painting have not slowed the outpouring of tourists who have visited over the centuries, despite a bishop stating that it was false, and continue to this day. We humans do not like to be shown that our beliefs were false, and our own stubbornness will override overt, incontrovertible evidence to the contrary, to the benefit of forgers. Thank you so much for your time, for putting up with my um, COVID <laughs> softened voice. Um, it's a real pleasure to participate in your event. Thank you once again for inviting me and best wishes.